Uh, good morning, everybody. I welcome members to the 26th meeting in 2015 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. As always, I ask members to turn off mobile phones, please. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. It's proposed the committee takes items seven to 11 in private. Item seven will allow the committee to consider further the delegated powers contained within the health, tobacco, nicotine, etc., and care Scotland bill. Item eight is for the committee to consider a correspondence with the convener of the standards, procedures, and public appointments committee on Scottish law commission bills. Item nine is a report on the work considered by the committee during the parliamentary year 2014-15. Item 10 will enable the committee to consider a draft report on the delegated powers provisions in the Succession Scotland Bill, and item 11 will allow the committee to consider the evidence received on the Succession Scotland Bill. Does the committee agree to take those items in private, please? Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item 2 is the aforementioned Succession Scotland Bill, and our next item today is further ev oral evidence on this bill. Uh, we'll take the evidence in, in two panels. Firstly, a panel of legal academics, and secondly, from Trust Bar, a group of Scottish advocates who specialise in the area of trust, executories, partnership, directors' duties, agencies, and other relationships of good faith. Uh, we look forward to that. But for the moment, we welcome the academic profess panel, who are Professor Janine Carruthers, who's the Professor of Private Law in the University of Glasgow, Professor Elizabeth Crawford, who's Honorary Research Fellow at the University of Glasgow, and Professor Roderick Paisley, who's the Chair of Scots Law at the University of Aberdeen. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming to join us. Um, and we start the questions, I have a sneaking suspicion, with myself. Um, can I start, please, with just the structure of what we're doing in this legislation and to ask you how desirable it is um, or possibly how undesirable it is to have two succession bills, not one, um, especially as the first one can be amended by secondary legislation by virtue of Section 25. Um, should we be seeking, as some have suggested, to consolidate these at a later stage? Please. Maybe to start, give a view. Um, I think in terms of seeing action and movement to bills is the sensible way forward. Uh, once two bills become two acts, however, I think it might be sensible to look at consolidating legislation so that there's not a risk of gap between two pieces of legislation or worse, uh, some sort of inconsistency. I think in practice it's easier to work from one consolidated uh, statute, but in terms of getting the legislation on the table, I think moving forward in two instalments is a sensible approach. Thank you. Can I just ask, in, in addition to that, whether you feel that it would be practicable when that consolidation occurs, assuming that it does, to try and consolidate absolutely everything in statute at that point? or whether that might be a just too big a task? I think it gives rise to the question whether it's necessary to put into legislative form a rule that is already uh, operating effectively at common law. Personally, I don't see the need to do that, but views will differ on that particular point. So do I think that we need a Succession Scotland Act to cover every element of Scots law of succession? No is my personal view. Mm -hmm. But if, it, if, if we're, and I'm sorry, I'm not a succession lawyer, but uh, there will be previous statutes which still interact. There might be several. I rather imagine there will be, given the way that law is scattered across the statute book. Have we reached a point where if we're consolidating the two that we're currently talking about, of which this is the first, that we really ought to make sure that everything's picked up from all the other statutes in the next succession bill? My view is that it's better to have fewer pieces of a jigsaw that have mm -hmm. to be put together. Um, it's simpler to work from a smaller number of statutes than, than a vast number. But it, I think, you know, perhaps other people might want to express a view on this as well. Um, I think we'll be doing well if we get the Succession Scotland Bill mm -hmm. and the next Succession Scotland Bill consolidated, um, it might be a, a third tranche to, to look at mopping up what has gone before. Right, thank and you. I think perhaps it would be too big a task to uh, try to put absolutely everything into some compendious act in the future. Um, after all, 
something like the formal validity of wills is very nicely situated in a Wills Act of 1963. Succinctly put, and one wouldn't want to disturb that. And equally, there are provisions to do with succession, for example, um, rights of cohabitants on intestacy. Well, that may come in in part two of your consideration. But there are succession points in family law statutes, and I would think it's sufficient to have something, if the Parliament wishes, to take the place of the Succession Act 64, which was a watershed, mm -hmm. and not to be more ambitious than that. Right. I think Stuart wants to make a point uh, on this. Do forgive me, Professor Carruthers. I just wanted to be clear. You use the phrase, in my personal opinion. Do you have another hat that you might wear where you would have a different opinion? Or was it just simply a, a conversational lubricant, the use of that phrase? Exactly the latter. Simply That's fine. Um, Sufficient. not wanting to suggest I was giving the view of this panel. That's fine. Thank you. In my opinion, I, I think it is possible to consolidate the existing statutory material on the law of succession into one act after these two bills are enacted. But I think it would be a, a step too far as regards a, getting it done on any timescale to try and consolidate the entirety of the law of succession because you bring in a vast amount of the law of trusts and executive yeah. administration, a, much of which works pretty well at common law in any event, and I think really that would be unnecessary. Right. I'm, I'm grateful for those general comments, and if I could just pursue one other general comment. We will, of course, get into the details of what's bef before us. Um, I'm just wondering if, if any of you have any sort of general comments on things that you feel maybe we've missed um, or anything in the bill that, that causes you, shall I say, a sort of general concern rather than the detail of the questions on specific phrases, which we will come to shortly. Um. I think it's an excellent idea to separate the technical from the more uh, policy-driven or controversial issues. But, of course, the difficulty is drawing that dividing line at times. And I know that certain topics have been put on to the later discussion for example, um, Section 9, People Who Die in a Common Calamity, um, has perhaps a, a more fundamental aspect to it than uh, perhaps should not be regarded as entirely a technical matter. Yes, I appreciate that, and, and Section 9 is one that undoubtedly we will come to. Um, I'd like to make a point, please, about uh, the Forfeiture Act of 1982. Uh, it's being amended in this Succession Scotland Bill. I'm quite surprised at that. I think it should have been dumped altogether, because it's one of the worst pieces of legislation ever passed by the Westminster Parliament. It's one of the few pieces of, of legislation to do with the law of succession that is UK-based. Most legislation is Scottish-based. This piece of legislation treated Scotland like Scotlandshire, as if Scotland didn't exist until about the second reading. It was a private member's bill, and it then was remedied in large measure by very late-in-the-day amendments. And Section 15 of this Scotland, Succession Scotland Bill is, aden, is again attempting to remedy it again, but it's a bit like trying to build a building on a pile of rubble. I, I think it should have gone completely, and we should have started. A, the reform in Section 15 misses out entirely the Scottish tradition of what's known as personal unworthiness. That is our tradition, not public policy forfeiture. Public policy forfeiture was foisted on us by the English, and really we should... If we're going to amend this Scotland Succession Scotland Bill Section 15, we've got to expand it to deal with personal unworthiness. But my own preference was to get rid of the Forfeiture Act 1982 altogether. It is, to use a technical term, terrible. Right. Thank, thank you for that comment, which is very much appreciated. Um, can we then move on to, uh, to Stuart uh, Stevenson, please, who will look at the uh, Section 1 and the effects of divorce? I, I want to just uh, probe uh, the provisions of Section 1 in relation to a guardian uh, of a child uh, and, and see whether the, the provisions in the bill uh, that, that cover where a will has appointed a former spouse or partner. 
uh, as the Guardian will, in the light of the increasing role of step parents uh, and indeed the costs and time scale of uh, going to law, uh, mean that the bill as uh, drafted is to your satisfaction or otherwise? I think in its written evidence, the Law Society of Scotland has drawn attention particularly to uh, inclusion of the word guardian in section uh, in clause 11A2 of the bill. I think I would agree with the observation that the Law Society has made, but in terms of accepting that as an objection to the the clause in itself. I, I, I wouldn't hold up the clause because of the inclusion of that guardianship issue. I think it's quite a small issue in the, the bigger scheme of what Clause 1 is, is endeavouring to do. Uh, right, if no one else wishes to contribute. Um, the, 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 the other thing, Trustmar has uh, raised the issue of um, uh, whether it should take effect at the point the marriage or civil partnership ended. Uh, if the person was domiciled in Scotland. Uh, but last week we had kind of mixed views as to uh, at what point and at what domicile, what residency should be used. Yes, Professor. Um, I've given some thought to this, and I tend to favour the characterisation and the, the manner of drafting that uh, is laid down at present. If It's always difficult to decide whether something of this matter is pertaining to the law of succession or pertaining to the law of marriage. And this has been drafted as a categorization in the law of succession, and it seems to work rather well in that um, if one regards this rule of the effect of divorce upon a will as a rule of the succession law of Scotland, then it would apply where the deceased died, died domiciled in Scotland. And I'm glad to see that in five, it is provided that the divorce must be recognised by the law of Scotland. That seems to me quite neat. You've covered both bases there. <coughs> I've tried to think how it could be drafted the other way, as if it were a matrimonial matter, and uh, I find it difficult, difficult to see how one would, would do this. I don't know if you have any extra views on that. Again, the evidence of the Faculty of Advocates the written evidence suggests that the Clause D could be drafted according to the testator's domicile at the date of the divorce, I think. And the objection or the possible criticism is mounted that if the test is domicile at death, then a testator, an individual, is not able to know the effect of the divorce or dissolution at that point. So the question of certainty um, is in suspense until death happens. But the point, as Professor Crawford has said, is that this is a rule of succession and that, in a sense, everything is in suspense until the point of death. Everything is in Kuwait until that point. And as a rule of succession, the connecting factor is correctly at the point of death. It, it's, a, it's really a, a nice point. It, there is a rule supported by precedent that the question whether a will is revoked by a marriage is a matter of matrimonial law to be decided by the domicile of the testator immediately after marriage. But I, th I would be inclined to draw a distinction between that and the situation which we are looking at now. Uh, which is presumably the case where a will is discovered many years after divorce and nobody thought to alter it. Well, I think that's um, uh, a matter. The effect of the divorce 
in my suggestion, is more clearly put as a matter of succession. And as drafted, the connecting factor would be the domicile at death of the testator. Is, is there a practical issue here as well in the sense that, first of all, the point made by Professor Crawford that it would be a divorce recognised under Scots law, which is restricting mm. immediately. Yeah. So there'll be categories of divorce is not recognised. Uh, but, but secondly, uh, that it would practically require inquiries to be made that might be inconclusive mm. in their outcome yes. and create uncertainty. Whereas death, notwithstanding what other parts of the bill are going to discuss, is substantially more certain. Yes. And will certainly happen at some point. Yes. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Really, um, the, cause one is about the applicability. This section applies where. And so tying it to the testator's domicile at death is really, um, it's, a, it's a sensible one insofar as only if the testator is domiciled at death in Scotland does this Scots law begin to have any relevance. It could become quite uncertain if the testator was domiciled at the point of the divorce in Scotland, but at the point of death was domiciled somewhere else. And the question of which country's law was applicable uh, would potentially give rise to more ambiguity. So simply to anchor it at death is the clearer approach as a choice of law rule. All right, that's helpful. Do, do you have anything to add? Yes, I'd like to comment really on this, the way the section is designed. This, I think, is really a provision of the law of succession. And the real intention here, the guts of this legislation, the purpose of this piece of legislation is to reflect what the testator would have wished to have happened mm -hmm. when they died. The last person they want to inherit is someone who is their ex-spouse. And it's intended to reflect the testator's intention. It goes about it in a slightly odd way because it indicates that if the four circumstances in section sub 1 are complied with, the ex-spouse will be deemed to, or treated as to as having failed to survive the testator. In other words, it's a bit like saying the testator has got his wish and it's as if his ex-spouse was dead. It's probably a better way to phrase it in the law of succession rather than say I wish she were dead. Than a better way to do it would simply to say that every will interpreted by the law of Scotland will be deemed to include an implied term that the spouse in question will not receive this particular benefit. Mm -hmm. And just say that for every will that is interpreted by Scots law, this will be implied. Now, a testator can make an express contradictor to that, should he or she wish to do so, and it gets over a, a, a minor flaw. I would have to say a minor flaw in this particular section, which is subsection 2, which says, for the purposes of the will, now please note it says will and not the provision, P is to be treated as having failed to survive the testator. Now, that mm -hmm. means the whole will, for the purposes of the entire will, not just the provision, the ex-spouse is treating as, treated as having failed to survive. If I were to leave a bequest to my son on the basis that he would get £100 if my a wife is alive a, and then leave a secondary provision that he will get £200 that, he will, that if my wife is dead, if I then divorce my wife this provision kicks in, even though the provision is in favour of my son. It actually makes a change for the purposes of the will. So it has a wider effect than is actually intended by virtue of the drafting in subsection 2. Mm -hmm. Now, if this really is about succession, it really is about what the testator wants in a will, and I think we should simply have a provision that we have a deemed implied term. We have that in contracts. We have that in 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 every other type of voluntary arrangement, and I think uh, testators would understand exactly what that meant. Thank you, Steve. Uh, this remark sort of opens up um, some terminological difficulties I've had as we've looked at this, in that there are two further places uh, in this uh, uh, bill where you're deemed to have died when you've not necessarily died. First of all, um, where there's a simultaneous or uncertain sequence of death, each is 
held to have died before the other from the point of view. I suppose that kind of makes sense, at least because people are dead. But in relation to parasite and other provisions uh, relating to inheriting when you've uh, committed a crime uh, uh, to the person who, who against the person who's died and controlling whether you can inherit, um, the provision again is in law that you're deemed to have died before the person. Is, is there a general difficulty around the way we describe and deal with these things? Uh, because we create the fiction that someone's dead for one legal purpose while physically they continue to live. Personally, I think the fewer legal fictions you have, the better. A, what you should try, try and do is a, move the law so it is as consonant as possible with the actual intentions of the testator if you're dealing with testamentary succession. There are some benefits, some technical benefits of simultaneous death in treating someone as already dead, and there are some technical provisions why that, where that would be appropriate, but I'm not sure that it's appropriate for this particular section. Different sections require different treatment. Okay. Please. Thank you. In relation to what Professor Paisley said, and with regard to Clause 1 2, for the purposes of the will, to save a, a lot of redrafting, would it be possible to say, for the purposes of the benefits or powers of appointment referred to in 1, uh, P is treated? Um, as having failed to survive, rather than for the purposes of the will, which is, as I, I see you pointed out, is very general. Mm -hmm. And then you could take out the bit about the guardian if, if, if practitioners feel that this is indeed likely to be problematic. Yep. I'm grateful for these very helpful evidence, which is going from the very general to the very particular, and it's all appreciated. I'm wondering whether we can leave that point and whether we can go on to rectification with Richard. Thank you. Okay. Um, several people who have given evidence to the committee have suggested that the scope of sections 3 to 4 on the bill, of the bill on rectification of wills should be broadened to include wills which have been drafted by the testator, such as handwritten wills, or wills created using templates which they found online. Uh, we'd just like to get uh, your views uh, and your opinion about this proposal. I personally would prefer that it were not widened out to deal with wills uh, written only by the testator uh, rather than prepared, and I would prefer that word in 1B rather than drafted, prepared by a third party. One of the reasons why rectification is important is certainly to reflect what the testator would certainly have wanted, mm -hmm. but it is also to, uh, to avoid negligence actions. Mm -hmm. Now, it is simply the case that when a will is prepared by a solicitor for a client, the solicitor can be sued for negligence if he writes down the will wrongly. Mm -hmm. A testator can never be sued for writing down his or her own will wrongly or leaving somebody out. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference in law between a will prepared by a uh, a, a client on his or her own and by a solicitor so I would not be minded for those reasons but probably much more pragmatically it is incredibly difficult to find evidence outside a solicitor's file or a will writer's file as to what a testator actually wanted I've been many in many houses where you go into the house and you find dozens and dozens and dozens of lists or receipts or half-baked wills or whatever and you would open up an extraordinary hunt for what the testator actually wanted in these lists or these undated receipts. And in addition, I have to say, I, I have a good estimation of the character of the average Scot, except when it comes to succession. <laughs> People become incredibly avaricious when they're getting something for nothing, and it is absolutely extraordinary what turns up in an office of a solicitor as being a note written by the testator that really wasn't signed, but this is really what mum wanted. Mm -hmm. So I think this would be disastrous. I mean, to take the point you, you made about, therefore, this could um, result in an increased number of challenges to, um, uh, to, to, to wills. Uh, but also people, um, for, so for example, Law Society said, actually, though, I mean, these documents can reflect what the testator wanted. And in fact, so somebody's gone to the effort of preparing this, this will, whether it be online or not, 
then if that reflects what they wanted, and that surely legislation should reflect that, so it can act, so it can be accurately, um, so their wishes can be fulfilled in that way. Well, I, th I think you'll find the canons of interpretation of wills are extraordinarily malleable. Right. Uh, words can mean almost the exact opposite of what they say when it comes to will. It's very unlike a contract. The courts go out of their way in extraordinary measure to treat a will as the unique document of the testator or testatrix, because that's what it is. And black can mean white, and red can mean blue uh, when it comes to a will, because the courts do tend to investigate background circumstances. So I wouldn't go so far as saying that there is an overwhelming need for rectification of homemade wills, because the courts actually do it quite openly uh, via a very open back door. Are there any other opinions from the, the panel on this? I would agree with what Professor Paisley has said, that in, in Clause 3.1b, the will was prepared is preferable wording than drafted. Possibly also, you mentioned online templates and such yeah. like. I think that's a bit of a red herring, because if a, an individual accesses a template and then downloads it for his or her own purposes. Really, the, the important point is whether he or she has taken professional advice in relation to that. If no advice has been taken, the template might as well have been uh, written by the, the, the individual personally. I've got another question on that. Yeah, you want to explore that point? Uh, well, it was exactly that point that I, I wanted to just be clear what prepared might mean. Because clearly, if you're traditionally visiting your lawyer and drawing up your will, that there are two aspects to it. The discussion and advice that might be provided, which will be specific to the individual and their circumstances. But then the expression of what the, is wanted in the drafting that the lawyer provides. So it is being suggested, I think, in what I've just heard, that the drafting is very much less important than the advice? Or is it that uh, they have to stand together? And if one part is absent, um, while the other might be present, then it is simply entirely the responsibility of the person who, the amateur, who's written their own will. Well, the act of consulting a solicitor means that one would hope there will have been advice and that that advice will then be implemented in the drafting. If there's a mismatch between what is drafted by the agent and then signed, uh, if there's a mismatch between that and the instructions that the client gave, then it might not be a case of rectification of a will, but it might well be a case that a, a, an intended beneficiary actually takes legal action by way of proceedings in, in negligence against the solicitor. That's a different thing to rectifying the will, but there is certainly a... a, a fairly substantial body of case law on negligence against solicitors for the failure accurately to implement the instructions. But yes, the, the provision of advice makes a difference. So just to be absolutely clear, um, if this bill as an act used the word prepared in broadly, in essentially as it's presently written, um, that would be restricted, you believe, to circumstances where the lawyer has provided advice and undertaken drafting, and other circumstances would not be caught. I would prefer the use of the word prepared by the test, not by the testator, rather than drafted, not by the testator, because I think prepared encompasses the situation where a testator has downloaded some sort of pro forma or template, whereas drafted does not potentially include that situation, because the words are those of a, a, a separate entity into which uh, the testator may have completed blanks effectively, um, and that is a different thing than drafting a, a deed in his or her own words. Okay. Hey. Along from that convener, in all evidence to the committee last week, Alan Barr of Brodie's uh, raised a specific point about whether wills created using performers from the internet actually indeed currently fall within the scope of Section 1 uh, because the testator is interacting with software, which, in Mr. Barr's opinion, may or may not constitute a will being drafted by a third party. So mm -hmm. I just want to, given your um, 
comments to Ms. Stewart and uh, Professor Crudders. I mean, what, what, what's your view that on, on, on Mr. Barr's suggestion on that point? Well, I think it, it all will depend very much on uh, the caveats and terms and conditions of the website from okay. which one downloads the document. I, right. I couldn't give a definitive view okay, on that, yeah. um, but my expectation would be that the website from which an individual downloads these things, or the, the, the pad of document paper which historically somebody might have bought in a newsagent, there will be a, a caveat in that sort of thing exempting the producer thereof of any liability okay. or responsibility for the, the, the testamentary consequences. I think it's helpful. D uh, uh, indeed. I mean, I, I can't help the feeling that this is an area which is going to prove complicated simply because we're now in the, that internet generation mm -hmm. and people are just going to believe that they can go and download something they can put in questions, they will get to the right answer, and that will constitute advice from somewhere. Mm. Um, uh, I'm not seeking to disagree with the answers that colleagues have just provided, but I can't see this problem going away, uh, which is why we, really must, we mainly must do our level best to make sure that what's in statute is as good as we can be uh, at the moment. However, if we can go on to John Scott, please, on the timing of an application for rectification. Thank you very much. Um, and can I take you now to uh, section four? Um, and time limits, if I may, please. And good morning. A, a, number, a number of people uh, giving evidence to the committee said it would be better if the relevant time limit for applying to the court for rectification ran from the date of death, given that a grant of confirmation can take many years. However, Ellie Scobie reminded the committee last week that until confirmation is granted, a will is not a public record document. She suggested that if the time period ran from the date of death, executors could delay the grant of confirmation when it was in their personal interest to do so. What are your views, if any, on that topic? Could I speak to that briefly? I, when someone dies in Scotland, one of the first things a solicitor will do if the will is in the office is register the will in the sheriff court books it then immediately becomes a public document and confirmation follows at a later stage. But it becomes a public document as soon as in a public record because anybody can go and look at it. So it becomes a public document as soon as it's registered. Now it's a voluntary act to register a will. It's only registered so it, if the original gets lost, a, a copy, a certified copy that's treated as the original can be obtained. But there is a possibility, I suspect, and you rightly bring it out that in the interests, the personal interests of someone stated to be the executor or even just a relative, they hide a will or delay bringing it to the attention of the beneficiaries for ages and ages. Personally, I take a view that a, you need a long deadline, by which, which is a fixed deadline, by which a, you can't go beyond except in cause shown. But I do think that would actually be a high-ranking candidate for a cause shown for extending a deadline. But quite apart from that, someone who hides a will or destroys a will like that, first of all, is open to an action a, themselves on the part of disappointed parties, possibly for some sort of delict. And secondly, there's another form of unworthiness in Scotland whereby any provision in respect of which they would have received under the will, they're struck out as unworthy. It's possible, and I would regard a subsection 2 in clause 4 as the way that you could deal with that, but I definitely would prepare, prefer a deadline running from death and not from the obtaining of confirmation. From death, right, thank you. Others have views? Is that with the permission of the yes, chairman, yes, yes. Uh, revert to a conflict of laws point. Um, section 3, uh, it makes it clear that before this can happen, the testator must have died domiciled in Scotland. So that's clear. And then later, it allocates to the court of session or the sheriff uh, the jurisdiction to consider uh, the possibility of rectifying the will um, according to habitual residence um, 
of the testator at death. So that, that seems to me quite clear. Uh, I do notice that in Section 2, unlike Section 1 and Section 3, there is no reference to the testator having died domiciled in Scotland before the uh, provision would apply. And again, Section 6 also is silent about the applicability of Scots law. Now, this is possibly quite all right, because Scots law applies, if it applies in the view of the court which is hearing the case. Um, it doesn't always need to be... Um, stated, but perhaps at the end of this process one ought to look at all these conflict of laws provisions to see that they are consistent with each other. For that, and that wasn't the question we were going to ask, so I'm grateful if you bring it up, Carothers. Just adding to that, um, when you mentioned omissions, potential omissions from the bill, uh, in the early consultation stage, reference was made to the fact that the UK has decided not to opt into the EU regulation on wills and succession. And the question was asked whether or not it would be prudent to adopt any of the provisions in that regulation within this legislation. After the analysis of responses was produced, it was indicated that the current legislative programme would not seek to deal with the, the cross-border elements. Mm -hmm. But following up on the points that Professor Crawford has made, um, in Clause 2 of the Bill, for example, 2.1, this section applies where property is held in the name of. Now, Clause 23.1 makes clear that property includes any interest in property, movable or immovable one imagines, but it doesn't specify whether the property is restricted to property in Scotland or property anywhere situated, and that is something that possibly should be clarified. Specifically into, in relation to clauses three and four that we've just been considering, clause four one, perhaps it should be clarified in uh, subclause A that in a case where confirmation in Scotland is obtained, is it really intended that a Scots court could be asked to rectify a foreign drawn deed? That could be a complicating factor um, if that is what is intended. Now, should it be specified that this provision is restricted to deeds drawn in Scotland or not? That's, that's a question. I'm not sure we should give a definitive answer to that today, but I think the point should be considered at yeah. least. Uh, I'm very grateful. Thank you. All of these things need to be considered. Um, great, I'm just thinking where have we got to. And John, are you carrying on? Thank you. Um, I move you on now to um, sections 9 and 11 and survivorship, if I may, please. And um, Professor Carruthers and Crawford, uh, you suggested in your uh, written response to the Scottish Government's consultation that the law of survivorship should not be included in a technical bill, and indeed you've already hinted to that this morning. Um, do you wish to expand on this view? Do you have any opinions um, to offer on it, oh, one or all of you? <laughs> or any further opinions to offer on it? Legal systems vary a great deal, I think, on this rule about deaths and a common calamity. And the succession regulation... I believe I'm right in saying is uh, comparable to what is in the bill. Um, but perhaps attention ought to be paid to the consequences of this. Uh, I don't see it as an entirely technical matter. Um, in 64, uh, we had the rule that the younger survived the elder, preserving... Um, possibly the natural order of succession. Um, so I'm merely suggesting that, in my view, perhaps greater consideration could be had of this in part two of your consultation. I would agree with that. It's, <clears throat> I don't have any objection to the formulation of the rule per se, but if one is uh, a beneficiary who is affected by the operation of this rule, then it's far from technical. So it's to do with the characterisation 
of the provision as technical and therefore being dealt with in this current bill, uh, as opposed to seeing it as having policy consequences and therefore more appropriately placed in the second tranche of legislation. And I think there are policy implications as a result of the, the change to the survivorship rules that is proposed here. For, forgive me for being so dumb, but what might those policy implications be rather than just the, the two beneficiaries, whether or not how beneficiaries are treated or not? Well, what, what I think that, be... that is the policy, you know, the, the manner of treatment of beneficiaries according to the order of death. Um, I, I think there is a policy in that. See. Yes, in a very classic exposition involving the law of Germany, a mother and daughter died in the Blitz on London and uh, a dis difference arose between how English law would treat that common calamity and how the German law would, and German law was applied with the result that the, 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 the daughter was not deemed to survive in order to take the inheritance from her mother. So there are complications, there are um, implications Whether or not this bill is before us is not strictly whether it has policy implications, but whether or not those policy implications have appeared to be mm. contentious, mm -hmm. where everybody's agreed on the policy implications, because there are often policy implications, then that was deemed to be something appropriate for this particular bill. But I accept that there will be views as to whether or not that's uh, correct. Right, I'm wondering whether John wants to take us... I wonder if Professor Paisley has anything to say on this matter. Yeah, for this to be in this bill... I, I think it's pretty well drafted. I, I would prefer, prefer. I think it was something by Trust Bar originally suggested that there be some form except, an exception uh, in relation to uh, the Crown Estate or the the rule of ultima sires, which is really the inheritor of last resort. It's really a forfeiture provision if you can't find anybody else. Uh, I would like to see a su subsection here whereby a, this a deeming people not to survive doesn't apply where it's a choice between ultimus hires because the dice are loaded against an individual. The crown never dies. I've understood that correctly. What you're saying is that the provisions seem to be fine as long as some human ultimately inherits. Yes. But if it just goes to the crown under intestacy or effectively in default, let's not even fight yes. about the legalities, then plainly that would never have been the testator's intention. That's correct. Um, and therefore the courts should find some default yes. uh, that, that would have a human consequence. Mm. Very interesting point. The, the, the policy intrudes because is it more likely if you have a rule of simultaneous death with neither surviving that there will be fewer humans to succeed and that it is more likely to go to the Crown as ultimate well, heir. Well, as a matter of logic, as a matter of mm. logic, it's absolutely impossible for the Crown to inherit anything in Scotland because everybody in this room is related. Yes. Uh, it's just a matter of proof. Uh, you're either descended, according to one view, from Adam and Eve, and that's written down as long ago as Maimonides in Spain, uh, or you're descended from somebody who came out of Africa uh, and you can prove it by your genes. There's a probability that all of us in here are more closely related than we are to the institution of the crown. So I, I would regard that as it's just a matter of proof. So acceptance that the, the state shouldn't inherit seems to me to be what almost everybody would want yep. in the law of succession. Yeah, I think the point's very well made. Thank you. Precisely what the default should be is maybe for others to worry about on another occasion. Um, John, does that complete what you want? No, no, perhaps not. Okay, thank you. On you go. Um, if that wasn't uncertain enough, can I take you now to the area of uncertainty and section 911, people dying simultaneously is, well, <laughs> is uncertain. What do you make of Trust Bar's point, supported by the Law Society last week, that the word uncertain is likely to lead to unnecessary litigation? Is that... Do you concur with that, given what you've just said, or not? Yes, I do agree with that rule. Does uncertain mean it is not certain? And if it isn't certain, is it just 99% clear? Certainty means 100%. So I would agree with what uh, the Law Society and Trust Bar say. Others? 
I think in the terms of the semantics of drafting, it could be more clearly stated what is intended, so yes, in which it is not certain. Given, given your early help in that regard, would you have any proposals to make in terms of more elegant drafting? It might be a form of words that would occur to you subsequently. Mm -hmm. Should it do so, do let us know, please. Thank you very much. That'll, that's all I need to say yes, Thank now. you very much. I think that brings us to Stuart uh, Stevenson on private international law. Uh, just an observation, I'm 38 generations and two marriages away from Malcolm Canmore. I shall now look more closely for the DNA connection, which is presently not in my family tree. Uh, but there we are. Um, turning to section 22, uh, and in particular where an executor uh, is looking, is, is to be sued, uh, section 22 creates... Uh, where the confirmation has been in Scotland, uh, they, they are caught by Scots law uh, in that regard. Is that satisfactory to the panel? I think this is useful. Yes, I think it does uh, close a gap. Uh, I think you were suggesting that if one is being very detailed about this, that one would remove the brackets there at where confirmation has been obtained in Scotland. Yes, I don't think the brackets add anything helpful in that provision. Presumably. Because it's very important, because that is the link that justifies the court in Scotland taking jurisdiction. Because the, the, in theory, jurisdiction should be taken on submission or residence or close connection. So the confirmation is providing that justification. So it should be there, plain and simple, without the brackets, I think. Uh, just as a matter of general principle, the punctuation is disregarded in interpretation anyway, isn't right. it? Right. Uh, as indeed headings are. Right. Yeah. Okay, convener, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Is there anything else in there at all that you want to worry about? No, there isn't. Right. Uh, Professor Carruthers. Add in relation to that uh, Clause 22.2, that is only a partial implementation of what was earlier proposed. It's a yep. helpful additional ground of jurisdiction, but the earlier recommendations did have additional grounds. Um, it's not altogether clear to us why those additional grounds have not been implemented in the legislation. In our initial response, we were happy with the additional uh, link based on the situation of immovable property in Scotland. Um, but insofar as we're asked for our opinion on, on the wording of Clause 22.2, we're content with it, subject to the removal of the, the, the parenthesis. Yep. Um, but we would have supported uh, a more expansive jurisdiction right. rule than this one. Given that you're here and you've raised the point, and it's absolutely fair, could you, could you put on the record uh, why that's the case in, in the context of the initial provision. I mean, I'm conscious you've written it down. Sorry, I, I don't think it's necessarily a matter of sort of rereading mm -hmm. the words of, of previous submission, but I think it would be helpful to the committee to have in, in the relatively short okay, terms, well, which I'm sure we and listeners can understand. Recommendation 50, uh, which provided that the Court of Session would have jurisdiction in relation to relevant proceedings, uh, not only where the deceased had died domiciled in Scotland. But, and this is uh, the particular provision, where the deceased died domiciled out with Scotland and the estate includes immovable property situated in Scotland, according to the current terms of the Civil Jurisdiction and Judgments Act 1982, Schedule 8, which uh, contains the relevant rules of jurisdiction uh, applicable to Scots law, to the Scottish courts, there is no particular rule on immovable property in the case of, of suing an executor who's domiciled outside Scotland mm -hmm. that would provide what that recommendation 51B provides. So we would have supported that in principle. What we have is a narrower provision in Clause 22.2. And have you any reason, have you any understanding of why that recommendation has not been followed up? No. no. So there's no reasoning which you can then comment on? No, we haven't seen any reasoning. That's not to say that it's not somewhere in the documentation, but we, we did look for it and didn't see right. anything. Thank you. That's appreciated. Right, John. Are there any other 
What are issues that you would like to raise or, or not? I think the point that we would say the UK decided not to opt into council regulation EU 650 2012 on the wills and succession, it's colloquially known as Rome 4. The fact that the UK, as a member state, decided not to opt into that instrument does not mean that UK citizens are unaffected by it. There are various cross-border succession issues which will prevent for Scottish residents, Scottish domiciliaries. As far as the EU regulation is concerned, we think it would be desirable for Scotland to act along with the UK in that rather than implementing specific provisions of the regulation within our own Scottish our, our, our own succession Scotland bill I think it would only add to the uncertainty in cross-border cases between Scotland and the rest of the UK if we had bespoke provisions akin to Rome 4 but not uh, not provisions which are matched by English law fitting consistency, even mm -hmm. if it's not always what you would have preferred. Mm -hmm. Yes, does Professor Paisley want to, to add well, anything to that? Please comment on other matters, if that's possible. Yes, please do. Uh, could I take you back very briefly to something that's unique to Scotland? Uh, the First Minister, I think, several months ago indicated it was highly desirable that all land should be registered in Scotland within 10 years. And there is something that's directly relevant to that in Section 2.3 of this bill, to do with special destinations. This reads, subsection 2 does not apply if the document under which property is held expressly provides all land that is registered is not held under any document at all. It's held under a, a title. So if you actually refer to a document in subsection 2, 3, this will affect nothing as regards property. You've got to delete that word and put in a registered title or title deeds. It's not going to be the case anymore after land is registered that you have bundles of deeds. It's an electronic title, so it's very important that this word document is not there, and you actually have a reference to an electronic title. Mm -hmm. Thank you. On an entirely different matter, Please to do. refer to something, this yes. is a number section 6, 1A. 6, 1A. This section applies where a will names as a beneficiary a person who is a direct descendant. Well, I could name my son as Robert Paisley and say that he's getting this, but if I just say I'm giving my son and don't name him, this won't apply. That word should be when a will identifies as a beneficiary by any means at all, because I'm not naming a person if I simply say I'm giving it to my son or my grandson. They're not named at all. It's, there's a very great difference between naming somebody in a will and identifying them in a will, yet I think this is intended to apply in every case. Yes. Uh, Particularly, perhaps, that might also cause a complication where people's normal names are not their given name, and you might well... I would normally refer to my son with a different name from the one that's actually on his birth certificate. In, indeed. It's not uncommon. And, and grandparents, in my experience, tend to get names wrong. Yes, you yes. forget names. Indeed. So it would be very important okay. to get that out. Yes. Uh, Section you. 12, if you don't mind, yes. this rule about a person forfeiting to be treated as having failed to survive him, this, I repeat, is an English rule, which was imported <laughs> into Scotland a, as a public policy rule. There is a direct parallel in Scotland known as personal unworthiness, which is a continental rule which we have from the European legal systems. It's part of our law, and the case law confirms that our law is based on one or the other, but it doesn't say it's just going to be public policy. If all we do is to amend the 1982 Act as regards the forfeiture rule, uh, rule as defined in the Forfeiture Act 1982, we haven't amended the unworthiness rule in Scotland, and we'll leave it intact. And I think this should be expanded to deal both with the English version, as we've imported via Northern Ireland, I to add, uh, and also the personal unworthiness rule. It's basically a rule in Scotland where you say someone shouldn't inherit because the testator wouldn't have wanted them to inherit because they've done something so unworthy. And very, it, just lastly, if you would bear with me a minute, a clause 20. I agree with everything that's been said in the submissions about 20, subsection 2. This is gifts made in contemplation of death. The phrase in contemplation of death is absolutely meaningless <laughs> and should be taken out. Thank you. I think
think there's a there's a final section of, of jurisprudence papers with that take that out discuss I seem to recall being there once but it's not it's good constitutional death should be taken out um, just for our sure donatio mortis causa means a donation in contemplation of death it's a direct Latin translation so a gift in contemplation of death other than a donation mortis causa means a, a gift mortis causa other than a donation mortis causa it just is completely nonsense you're saying it, it has to be this but it can't be that at the same time it's logically incoherent Fine. I think we'll we'll let the pardon me. We'll let the the, the draftsmen and women um, worry, worry about that. But thank you, I'm Father. Since we have such eminent people in front of us, is, would that be a view shared by others? It has been around for quite some time. In contemplation of death as a concept, would you agree with uh, Professor Paisley, or would you, or, or being lawyers, might you disagree? I think I'm not quite so concerned about it as Professor Paisley would be, uh, but on that particular point I'm, I'm happy to defer to his view. He's more expert in donations mortis causa than am I, <laughs> unless I perhaps it's a cross-border one. <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is, whatever it is, this gift that we're trying to allow is a gift made during life. When people contemplate their death occasionally, I might do it this afternoon, but it, it doesn't mean that a, it's a gift that only happens if I die. You know, I, most people, if they're really sensible, empty the bucket and give everything away before they die so there's nothing left. The richest person in the world is the person who dies with nothing. Yes. Indeed. And one could, con could easily argue that anybody who's writing a mill is contemplating their death because there's no other purpose for which one would write a will. Um, right. On that esoteric point, perhaps, I'm looking at my colleagues and it looks as though we may have covered everything that we need to cover. Is there anything else that any of the panel would like to, to raise with us? Can I say that's both not only been very informative, but actually quite an enjoyable discussion. So thank you very much for your, your efforts, uh, uh, ladies and, uh, and gentlemen. And I'll very briefly suspend just so we can change the, the panel over. Thank you.
Right, thank you very much. Um, resuming, it's my pleasure to welcome to the meeting uh, David Bartos and Nick Holroyd, who are here from Trust Bar. Um, and our first question comes from Stuart Stevenson. Um, just uh, going to the, the, the subject of guardianship and, and, and Section 1. Um, and uh, should the provisions of a will uh, appointing an ex-spouse as a guardian fall within the scope of Section 1 or otherwise? Let me begin answering that question. The first um, difficulty upon which I do not wish to dwell, but I flag it up in any case, is that very often in wills, the phrase guardian is used in a multiplicity of different ways, which do not always uh, chime perfectly with the way in which they're used in a family law context. And so far as uh, Trust Bar could see, and we welcome correction, there wasn't uh, any express definition of guardian within the uh, 2015 bill. So on the assumption um, that what we're dealing with is a guardian in the family law sense, and that's to say in terms of Section 7 of the Children's Scotland Act 1995, that would contemplate a situation uh, where one is dealing with someone who has parental responsibilities and rights and duties who is not a parent. So it's just a, it's a clarificatory issue uh, there. When one considers the family law legislation, and in particular Section 7 of the Children's Scotland Act 1995, 95, uh, one doesn't find uh, that that contemplates death uh, uh, or, 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 or divorce prompting um, uh, revocation. So that section 7 refers to documents, and that would be capable of including a will. But it, so it would be slightly at odds uh, if um, divorce or annulment in a succession context did prompt the uh, extinguishing uh, of that provision. It's not something I think we feel very strongly about, but it's something which I think is, is worth um, thinking through. And I know it's something which has, uh, that uh, David Bartas has also given considerable attention towards. Yeah, yes, if I, if I could elaborate on that, um, uh, Section 7 of the Children's Scotland Act 1995 um, allows a person to uh, make a document uh, appointing um, uh, another person to be guardian of their children upon their death. Um, Section 7 uh, does not say that it has to be in a will. It's enough it can be in any document. This appointment of the guardian can be in any document. That's what Section 7 provides. Um, there is no provision within Section 7 of the Children's Act uh, that the document is to become ineffective if the um, guardian-to-be uh, uh, becomes divorced from the grantor of the document. There's no, there's no provision for um, uh, the, the appointment to, to be revoked in Section 7. Um, the effect of the proposal in Section 1 of the bill uh, is that um, it would create uh, an anomalous situation in the sense that um, uh, if one uh, uh, made an appointment uh, of a guardian uh, in a document that was not a will uh, and um, the grantee, as it were, became divorced from the grantee, uh, then nevertheless that document would still remain valid. But if the appointment happened to be made in a will, the appointment would cease to be valid. Now, it seems that that is an anomalous situation and um, isn't one that is in principle desirable, but yet that will be the effect if section one um, includes the words or um, guardian. And, the, and the, second, the second point, and this really relates to how it is that we've got here with having the words or guardian uh, within the bill, and that is that essentially those words, the suggestion that um, uh, appointments as guardian might be revoked by 
uh, the divorce or annulment. That goes back to a Scottish Law Commission discussion paper in the mid-80s, which was before the Children Act was enacted. And it was simply put out for discussion. A majority of people who responded to that consultation paper in the early 80s indicated they would have no objection to that. The matter then became incorporated, the words all guardian, then became incorporated in the 1990 Law Commission report, and that was then repeated in the 2000 and in the 2009 report. So it, it, it seems that, that the matter has not really been given full consideration with all respect to the Law Commission. Um, uh, and uh, in any event, um, it would create a, an anomaly, which is the one I've just said, which is if the appointment's made in a document that's not a will, and there's a divorce, divorce has no effect, but if it happens to be in a will, according to this section, it's revoked, and that, that seems just inconsistent. Can, can I just be absolutely clear, absolutely clear, when a guardianship is created uh, by the family law piece of legislation, that takes effect at that point? Um, it, it, it depends on how the guardianship is created. It can be created by an application to the court, Yes. in which case it, it takes effect upon the... Um, uh, upon the court decree, yes. or it can be done in a document, uh, that document to take effect upon death. So it's a contingent provision. It's a contingent, it's a contingent yes. provision. Um, and uh, as I indicated, Section 7 simply says that you can put it into a document. It doesn't have to be a will. Yes, yes. Um, so... so, so, so when it's a contingent provision, the effect in law, logically, you suggest, should be the same in the two contexts. Now, of course, what Section 1 appears to be trying to do is to catch those circumstances where no other provision has been made. Is that how you read it? I would, I I would read it as, um, uh, as restricted to wills. So... Uh, if the appointment of the guardian is made in a will uh, and subsequent to that will um, the person appointed as guardian is, is divorced from the grantor, uh, then that appointment ceases to have effect. Section 1 does not relate to non-will appointments, but yet the, the, the Children's Act clearly contemplates you can have non-will appointments. Just a document does nothing else but make the appointment. No, no other legacies. It's not testamentary. It's, it's this, so therefore it's not a will on any normal uh, understanding of that word. Um, so in that case, um, uh, the divorce would, would have no effect. I think really what, what this is um, going into really is going into an area of family law um, in, in a... Um, uh, success in a piece of succession legislation. Can I, can I just ask then, forgive me, Stuart, can I just ask then if, if we finished up with two documents, which you've just described for me, one the testamentary one and one the non testamentary one, which trumps which? And does it matter in which order they were created? Uh, I would. Um, uh, I haven't thought about that question, but I would have thought as a matter of general principle, um, the latter would trump the former yes. um, in, uh, yeah. whatever, in whatever form it happened to be. But that's just a... Uh, that's just a that would sound like a good principle anyway. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a tentative view based on just general principle. A latter will generally revokes a former, a latter contract, which covers the same material as the previous contract yep. and supersedes the previous one. Yes, OK. John, sorry. At the very least, there needs to be a harmonisation of these <coughs> two pieces of legislation. Uh, and I think that's a point well made, uh, which hopefully we will take note of. Thank you. I think, John, Stuart, yeah, you want to carry on? Um, it, just the, the Section 1 also has issues related to domicile, um, and I wondered whether you had any comments on that. Yes, in, in broad terms, uh, trust bar is of the view that one should 
focus, if one is, this, perhaps I can preface this, on the hypothesis that we are going to deal with guardians in the way that it's currently dealt with in section 1 1. <coughs> so we, on that hypothesis, which of course is one we're slightly querying, but if one goes to look at the question of whether it should be domicile at death or domicile at divorce, we favour the divorce approach. And the reason for that is that one might analyse it in terms of a, a species of partial revocation, partial revocation of the will arising by operation of a, a statutory provision. And uh, our understanding of the, the general law in this area is that you should look when you're considering whether or not an, an alleged act of revocation has been effective, one should look at the domicile of the person allegedly revoking at the time of the act of the alleged revocation. And we draw some support for um, this view uh, by analogy to what happens where you have a, an international context and uh, under the law of uh, one country, a marriage subsequent to the will gives rise to revocation. And in those circumstances, you could, you could have a, a, a valid a will which was, there's nothing wrong with it in, in terms of purely domestic Scots law, uh, and there's no incapacity, nothing like that. And marriage, if it was purely domestic to Scotland, would not lead to a revocation of the will or uh, a partial revocation of the will extinguishing the, uh, somebody else's rights. But if there's an international context, what you do is you, you look at the law of the domicile of the testator immediately after marriage. And the support for that view uh, can be found in, in standard textbooks for the, for, for in relation to that marriage point. For example, uh, Professor... Professors Crawford and Carruthers, in, uh, the f in the third edition of their book, touch on this at paragraph uh, 1834, and I'm very obliged to Professor Crawford. I, I was allowed a glimpse of the fourth edition, and it is now paragraph 1839. Now, the views I'm expressing are trust bars views, and I think uh, the professors Crawford and Carruthers have a different view on this particular issue, but by analogy to that, I think one could say one's dealing with a, a, a partial revocation arising from statute. And when you're looking at that, it, it, it would be my suggestion that we should look at the law of the domicile of the alleged partial revoker at the time they do the act. Is that, sorry, just so I can be clear on this before moving on to further complexities, um, is there a distinction in this respect between heritable and movable? Uh, assets? And the answer I might be no. I, I don't understand there to be. Um, certainly, so far as the, the leading Scots case, common law at the moment on revocation, um, what happened in, in that case was that um, uh, there was a marriage of a, a, a lady who was in England, um, and she later died uh, domiciled in Scotland. At the time, uh, of the um, uh, at the time of the marriage, she was in England, and the court held that um, whether that marriage revoked her will uh, was to be decided by English law, as uh, that was the law uh, of her domicile at the time of the revocation. So um, uh, that's the common law already. Already the already the common law. Um, it's a case called Westerman against Schwab. Um, the common law already says that revocation of a will is to be assessed by the law of the domicile of the person at the time of the alleged revocation. So again, the common law is already there. If the suggestion in, um, uh, in, section, in, in, the, in the relevant section was to be adopted as it is in the bill, then in effect, again, there will be two tiers would be created. There would be one law relating to revocation generally, uh, but a separate law relating to revocation by divorce or annulment. And it seems that it's inherently, from a user-friendly point of view, not a, uh, not a good idea to have to have too many um, uh, 
different laws applicable for different types of, of revocation. But the other, the other point as well is that this is something, um, this idea that one looks to the, um, uh, the applicable law at the act of revocation is something which um, is internationally recognised and we see that um, in the EU regulation that has been referred to uh, because in the EU regulation that has been referred to uh, the general um, law governing succession is the one um, of habitual residence uh, of the deceased at death. That's the general rule. But then to that, there are exceptions instated in that regulation, one of which um, is the assessment of whether a will has been revoked. And in terms of that regulation, it says that, the, um, uh, that it is the law of the habitual residence at the time of the alleged revocation uh, that is uh, to uh, apply. So... Um, whilst we're not adopting habitual residence and we're not adopting the regulation, I simply mention it as an indicator of internationally how these things are looked at. And there's a good reason why it's done that way, and that is that um, it allows um, estate planning. People need to know where they stand, and um, tying it to the date of the alleged revocation um, uh, allows people to know with some certainty and to receive clear advice as to whether that will has been revoked or has not been revoked. Um, otherwise, one might have a, a floating, a floating uh, situation. So, um, uh, in a nutshell, the common law already directs us to, to, the, to the date of to the uh, act of revocation. It's in line internationally, and um, there's a good planning reason behind it. I, I hope I'm not going to regret asking this, but. If the, you're tying it to the date of revocation, that clearly precedes whatever jurisdiction that revocation took place, um, reallocation of assets to the now separated partners. Does that, in effect, draw that separation of assets back into the revocation as part of the consideration of the executive? Because it kind of, to a lay person, uh, sounds as if that might um, there might be something in that. I'm sorry, no, no doubt. The fault's mine. I'm having slight difficulty in following this, the scenario there. Well, let me explain yes. my layman's difficulty. Um, that, that if you have a will, and that will is then overturned, um, at the point it's overturned, there will be assets. But something in law happens to those assets before death occurs, and then the assets are now distributed to different parties. Mm -hmm. If you're going back to the point to, to, as if the will had never been written, is there any interaction with that? And the, the simple answer might be no. I wonder I think if I can take that point. Yeah. You've raised, I think, an extremely important point, which has ramifications in various areas of, of divorce and succession law. One, in assessing who owns what, one would need to look at the, the law of, 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 of divorce law and of general law. And, in, for example, in Scots law, there are various presumptions where couples are married or couples are cohabiting, slightly different in each case. So you're absolutely right. It would be very important to know who owns what. Um, where the will is, extinct, where the will is um, extinguished in favour of a, a, a particular person or is taken, you know, it's not effective in relation to a particular person, uh, then that as it were, removes their opportunity to benefit under the will. But I think it would be silent as to the question of whether the husband or the wife prior to um, the divorce or annulment, what they owned. But there would be some guidance, for example, in a Scottish domestic context, there is guidance as to presumptions as to who owns certain assets for, in relation to household goods, mm -hmm. but very crudely, it might, it might, there might be a presumption of equality. 
Yes, I, I think the, the scenario which, which um, you laid out um, uh, can, can easily be imagined. What, what effectively um, uh, would be seen is that uh, when the, uh, the divorce or the annulment took effect, uh, then uh, one would see that that will had been uh, revoked at that point, one would expect to know whether that person has been domiciled in Scotland at that time. And so far as the distribution of the estate is concerned, one would prima facie be in a situation of intestacy unless then a fresh will was made. And uh, it seems that ultimately um, uh, in intestacy um, is the preferred fallback here rather than it, rather than um, uh, the um, uh, rather than the um, yeah, rather than the um, the spouse inheriting but with one as i'm as i'm uh, correctly reminded with one uh, reservation and that of course is that um, uh, if the will provides that um, failing the now divorced wife or husband, somebody else is to inherit, or there is a residue clause, then the persons entitled to inherit under those provisions or the residue clause will inherit, will take the spouse's share. And finally, I, I, I hope uh, that's I think, clarified. I, I think I'm getting there, although I may have to read the official report to know if I have. <laughs> if there were, for example, if this couple who, who sadly get divorced, if the couple had children, um, and uh, that might raise issues both in relation to the, um, depending on precisely how one construed Section 1, it, it, the possibility is the children might either take under the residue clause or on possibly on certain scenarios they, they might uh, take in place of the uh, of the of the parent uh, I, I just want to pick up uh, that, that professor Crawford made the point and I interacted with her that it's where it's a divorce recognized under Scots law just just for clarity uh, where the divorce is not recognized by Scots law in effect it has not happened from the point of view of our law. Right, that's fine. Yes. Thank you. Okay, I think that takes us to uh, notification, Ms. Richard. Is that right? Uh, in your written <coughs> evidence, along with others, you suggested that the scope of sections three uh, to four of the bill should be broadened to include wills drafted by the testator, uh, such as handwritten wills or wills which have been uh, created using templates found online. Uh, and I just want to um, probe that further with you, because obviously there's not unanimity on this position. You may, may have heard from the, you, you will have heard from the, from the other panel. So I'd just like to, if you could just expand your, on, on, on why you've made that suggestion, and also uh, it, perhaps you know come back on some of the arguments which are made, you know, counter to this proposition like earlier on. Yes, if I can just outline the position, our position is based both on issues of principle. Uh, and on issues of practicality, and to some extent there is an overlap between those two categories. In relation to principle, uh, it seems to us that uh, if someone makes uh, uh, a clerical type error or perhaps some other sort of error in a DIY will, um, then their intentions are being uh, defeated if there is the, not the opportunity for rectification. There is a, an English case, a case called uh, Williams, 1985, One Weekly Law Reports, 905, and at pages 911 to, to 12, 912, uh, the, the English judge, and it, it's not a binding comment by him because it's not, he's not directly concerned with it, it's an aside. But he makes the point that you don't need to have a clerk to make a clerical error. So one can easily imagine somebody uh, who is perfectly capable in the sense that they have capacity uh, and is not being unduly influenced by anybody. They decide they're going to make their own will. And they make a rough draft and they make um, annotations to it. And then particularly... 
uh, those who uh, uh, those who are OCD, if I can use that phrase in a very loose and non-PC sense, they may wish to make a fair copy of it. And one can imagine it'd be very easy in the process of making a fair copy to uh, miss something out. So, for example, they may have uh, they may have identified their children, whether by name or otherwise, or their grandchildren, and they've written them out. And you know, for no good reason other than they have made a clerical type error, it doesn't appear in the version uh, uh, which they sign. Now, I appreciate there could be um, um, evidential issues, but trust law doesn't consider that the evidential um, tale should wag the dog here. So that's the point of principle. There are also, I, th I would suggest, practical reasons for favoring a, a wider approach. And the first one of those uh, is that there, can, there could very easily be difficulties in discerning whether one is dealing with a purely DIY will or one which has either been prepared or drafted, depending on the terminology which one favors. One tends at the moment to think of people either getting a will from the, the uh, a, a will form from the post office and filling it in and signing it, or perhaps a, a comparable online version. But it seems to me that one could have different sorts of errors very easily. One could have a, 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 an online will system where one is asked questions, and then the questions, the answers to the questions, lead to a will being drafted. And again, uh, either through uh, problems with the uh, software or perhaps, and we've all done this, having to fill in forms, you know, repeat your email address and one just copies it again, copies and pastes it. One can envisage a similar thing happening with, with that, that a testator could uh, imperfectly com complete the, the answer. So it seems to me there could be gray areas and if one is going to go, and our view, of course, is that it should extend to DIY wills, but if one is going to go down the route of excluding DIY wills, I think what one would need to do would say, say something along the lines of wholly drafted or wholly prepared. There's an even more mundane example where you could get the mixed situation. A solicitor drafts the will and... Um, Perhaps it's a sophisticated uh, will drafter and they use defined terms and the testator hasn't just skims through the will and s sees a reference to a particular defined term and says, no, that's not what I meant, I meant, and he changes it and it could have knock-on effects. So again, if we're, if we're, we're anti-rectification, statutory rectification for DIY wills, I think it should have the word holy in it, but we would favor the broader approach. And the, the, the final point, so this is really a, a practical point as well, if one uh, were to exclude DIY wills from the statutory rectification regime, and if uh, the committee favours trust bar's position that um, so the statutory rectification regime should not prejudice the existing common law, whatever that may be, uh, then what might very well happen, particularly in light of Lord Hodge's comments in an English appeal to the UK Supreme Court, a case called Marley, it may well be uh, that uh, when it, someone who is faced with a DIY will, in Marley they wasn't a DIY will, but it might be a DIY will, someone might attempt to go down the common law route rather than the statutory route. So it seems to me better on the whole if people's first port of call is the uh, statutory regime, and it's only if the statutory regime doesn't accommodate them that they go down the common law route. So for those reasons, which are a combination of matters of principle and, I would suggest, very practical matters, uh, we favor uh, an approach which would allow uh, rectification. And bearing in mind also uh, that... In, in civil matters, yes, there'll be evidential difficulties, but one's always in civil, or nearly always in civil matters, dealing with a balance of probabilities anyway. That's something which advisors and the courts have to face up to, and no doubt there'll be the odd uh, duff claim, but equally there may be some very well-grounded ones, but it would be for the person seeking rectification uh, to make out their case on a balance of probabilities. 
There is a, a point which I'd very much like to pick up uh, from Professor Paisley's evidence as well. There was a suggestion that the court can use great imagination in interpreting wills and great skills and breadth of interpretation. That is, I think, true. However, it seems to be much better if one can separate off interpretation of a document from rectification. So what one might say is properly interpreted, the will means this, and Johnny should benefit. If the will doesn't bear that interpretation, then it should be rectified uh, to uh, bear that interpretation. So it seems to me that whilst there is merit in what Professor Paisley said, it seems to me desirable to keep clear in one's own mind the distinction between interpretation and rectification. One of the very fashionable things uh, which has come from south of the border and which I am not wildly enthusiastic about is the idea of trying to treat the interpretation of wills in exactly the same way as the interpretation of contracts. And one of the differences I would suggest is that in relation to the interpretation of wills, there should be, should be a general reluctance to try and have all sorts of evidence which from outside the will brought in. Yes, you can put yourself in the, the, the seat of the armchair of the testator when he made the will, but what you can't can't do is you can't have a, generally speaking, you can't have a trawl over all the evidence to see um, what the person meant. So I think we can keep interpretation separate from rectification. And again, I think that adds weight that it would more likely to produce a fair outcome uh, if one could have rectification for DIY wills. I, I appreciate that point and the point you made about um, the, the matter of principle as well. But you yourself mentioned grey areas uh, earlier on in your uh, response in terms of um, cases which may arise. I mean, isn't there um, a danger here that you're introducing a very wide range of legal complexity by including um, handwritten wills and, and internet template wills in this provision? And also a practical issue that you know, the broader the provisions are, the higher the risk that every disappointed beneficiary is going to use the, the powers in question. I wonder how you would address those points. Yes, I, I think there the would undoubtedly be difficult cases, but I come back to the point that normally um, one would just take the view, what is the evidence to support the position? And then one would okay. have to establish a balance of probabilities one's, one's case. But there would be difficult cases that trust bar fully accept that. And do you think there would be more cases or challenges um, in, if, if, if this provision is included, if the, if the provision is broadened, sorry? I'm really into the realms of speculation and guesswork, but I suspect the answer is yes, but it's very hard to quantify that. And finally, for me in this uh, convener, in oral evidence to the committee last week, Alan Barr of Brodie's raised a specific point about whether wills created using pro formas from the internet currently fall within the scope of Section 1, uh, arguing the testator is interacting with software, which in Mr Barr's opinion may or may not constitute, in fact, a will being draft drafted by a third party. Again, you'll have heard the question put to the previous panel as well. I wonder what, what your view was on that point. Yes, I, I think this is this goes, again, I think it's a very valuable point which the, the committee has raised and, and Alan Barr addressed. This, is, this was one of the, the practical difficulties which uh, I, I touched upon. In some cases, it would be very difficult to know whether, it's a, whether it, a, it falls out with the regime by reason of not having been drafted or prepared by someone else. So if one was going to go down that route, uh, the route I don't favour and trust bar doesn't favour, I think one would have to say wholly prepared. I mean, Professor Crothers, I, 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 yeah, right, yeah, right, I think... Sorry, I think, sorry. Sorry, yes, if I, if I can add to that, I mean... At the moment, the provision says um, uh, this section applies where the will was drafted not by the testator, but on the testator's instructions. Um, I think that a court would understand that uh, as um, uh, excluding uh, the situation where uh, somebody went on the internet and excluding. and excluding. It would not cover the internet situation. Um, so it wouldn't currently fall within Section 1, would be your understanding? The internet situation would not currently right. fall, because I think a court would view that uh, as covering only where one person instructs another person to, to, to carry out the drafting. Uh, that's, the, um, uh, that's the sort of background upon which um, uh, this has been created. And in fact, um, 
it, it owes its origin to English provisions which predate the um, the spirit owes itself to English provisions that predate the internet. So. Um, uh, my view would be the internet situation is not covered under the existing provision that we would say adds force to expanding uh, the existing uh, provision. Um, there is one other point I, I would wish to raise in relation to section three, but I don't know if you have any further questions. No, I'm down there for the question. Uh, raise that point now, please do. Yes, <coughs> um, the, the, point, the point relates to um, uh, third parties uh, and uh, the uh, effect that um, uh, rectification of a will uh, may have on the uh, position of uh, third parties who have arranged their affairs uh, on the basis that um, the will is in its unrectified form. To give an example, um, for example, a person leaves uh, a, a property to uh, their son B, um, that's the uh, basis upon which um, son B uh, expects to take uh, the property. Uh, son B then obtains a loan which he expects to uh, repay from the, uh, uh, from the value of that property. Uh, thereupon, uh, somebody else comes in and says, actually, this will should be rectified so the property does not go to you but goes to me but yet the son has already acted on the basis of the unrectified will. As the legislation stands at the moment, it gives the court no guidance as to um, uh, how it is to uh, treat the prejudice uh, being caused to uh, the son, I've called him son B. And that, uh, it seems, uh, is a, um, a clear um, hole in the uh, statutory provisions and uh, the hole in a sense is is emphasized by the fact that there are already rectification provisions on the statute book this problem is not new uh, and these rectification provisions are contained in uh, the law reform miscellaneous provisions Scotland Act of 1985 sections 8 and 9 as things stand, as those sections were enacted, uh, wills were omitted from those sections in the mid 80s because um, uh, it was thought that there should be further consultation on whether wills should be included. Um, uh, and uh, so that was meant to be only a temporary thing. Uh, those provisions themselves. Um, cover, for example, uh, the granting of trust deeds during lifetime and that take effect during the lifetime. Uh, those trust deeds in their effect, other than they take effect during life, are in fact extremely analogous to wills. Indeed, many wills contain trust provisions. The only difference between a will that contains a trust provision and a will and, and, a, and a lifetime trust deed is that the will with the trust provision takes effect on death, whereas the lifetime one takes effect during life. But ultimately, they do really the same, they fulfill the same role. And Section 9 of the 1985 Act provides protection uh, for third parties, such as the son B that I've uh, mentioned. Uh, and uh, that protection um, is, it's in, it's in Section 9, and we put it um, in the back of our, uh, back of our written uh, evidence uh, and uh, section 9 uh, uh, provides that the rectification is to take place only if the court is satisfied uh, that the interests of a person to whom the section applies would not be adversely affected to a material extent by the rectification or that that person has consented to the proposed rectification and the person in question simply put is the son B that I've mentioned in, in, in my example. Um, and we can see no reason why the provisions of Section 9 should not apply to wills as they do to lifetime trust deeds. 
Um, Stuart, uh, did you want? Did you want to? Uh, to go back to just the internet briefly. Okay. Yeah. So I, I I think it's an important thing, which is why I I I I do wish to I do wish to emphasise on it because it will arise in practice. There will be third parties affected by rectification of deeds. No okay. question. Can, can I pursue that then? I think Stuart yeah. wants to go back to, to something else um, because I'm not sure whether B has acted during the lifetime of the testator or after death and therefore on the expectation that the will will be carried forward. Because it does seem to me that if B has acted before his father has died, then all sorts of very simple commercial caveat emptor kind of things apply, and if the person who lent it to them doesn't have some protection against the asset, then that's their fault, quite frankly, and that's what commercial law is going to say. If, however, B has acted after death and on the expectation... Um, and particularly if something has already been conveyed to him, then can I just make the point that I think section 19 might well apply? Um, and therefore my question is, uh, uh, does section 19 not apply in the circumstances that you're bringing to us? Uh, section 19 uh, relates to uh, uh, protection um, of persons acquiring property in good faith and for value, um, the key words being uh, for value, whether by purchase or otherwise. In the example which I gave, B, uh, the son who inherits under the unrectified yeah. will, he simply acquires it without value. So he's, he doesn't get any protection from Section 19. Well, not even Section 19 two B, because that talks about distributed. Um, uh, that, that relates to... Um, no, that, that relates to persons who've acquired from B. Yep, okay. In which case, thank you. I just wanted to challenge So, that. Um, B, is still, B is still um, uh, left with uh, having to meet the, the loan in my scenario yep. without having the property. Thank you. Yep. just wanted to explore around that. Yep. Very grateful. Mm -hmm. Right, Stuart, do we... Do you, um, back again. Just, just thinking a little bit more about the, let me call it, the internet exclusion. Yes. I just wanted to test what that means. Um, and I will do so by starting mm -hmm. where the interaction between the person writing the will and the legal advisor has been by telephone. That is okay. Uh, that would be covered, yes. That, that's okay. Right. Where the telephone service is provided by technology only available on the Internet, of which Skype would be an example, it's not intended that the Internet exclusion you refer to excludes that. If the instructions are being given um, uh, by, if, if the instructions are being given to the will drafter over Skype, then that would uh, be covered by the existing provisions. Yeah. Uh, so, unless so you've other. I, I think there's a, 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 a nuanced, uh, a, a very slightly nuanced difference uh, between uh, David and myself on this so it, it, it's only I think it's only a, a cigarette paper of difference in most cases uh, I am at one with David in relation to the view that as currently worded uh, a, a will made over the internet will uh, by the testator uh, a sort of program type will or a downloaded pro forma, in most cases I think it would not be covered because the wording at, at present is this section applies, then B, the will was drafted not by the, by the testator but on the testator's instructions. So in most cases the testator, uh, the testator will be having a hand in the drafting, as it were, and that would seem to, to, to take it out of the rectification regime. But where I think it becomes more difficult is the situation where you have a situation which I postulated where uh, you are asked a series of questions uh, by uh, over the internet and you give answers to those questions and perhaps also inadvertently copy and paste something slightly wrongly. So you, 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 you are, in a, in a sense, you're giving instructions to the uh, computer and in turn, I suppose, the, the actual company behind the computer, and you then get a will printed off at the end and you sign it, it it's difficult to say that, that that might, in my view, 
might be a situation where the will was not the will was drafted not by the testator but on the testator's instructions. And he, I, I just wanted to be clear. We've we've hung this on the internet, and that seems to me to be unhelpful. When it seems that what I'm hearing is that the test is whether there is a human being interacting with a person giving the instructions. It wouldn't have and to be. And it's the presence or absence of that human being rather than the mechanism of communication and the presence of computer systems that are helping and assisting in the drafting of the final document. They are not really... Well, I think you've... I'm, I'm, I'm really capturing what I'm hearing. I think, I think you, you've raised a tremendously, tremendously good point. It seems to me, if one, to use, a, use it in a very glib sense... If one is answering questions posed by a robot, so to speak, it might be, and then the will is produced at the end and you sign it. There's a, there's a, there's a non-human dealing with the Q&A. So the answers come from the, the test data, the human, but the questions are posed by the robot. But behind the robot, in a the sense, there is the programmer and the company who's providing the service. On that scenario, it seems to me there is some scope for arguing that uh, one is is uh, is is dealing with a situation where the bill, as currently word, worded, would allow for statutory rectification, because the will hasn't been drafted by the testator. What's happened is answers have been provided by the testator, but it has been on the testator's instructions because it's instructed the robot and the company behind the robot. But the the bigger point, which I think you may be. Uh, may be alluding to, which is something which troubles me, is the much more mundane situation. Um, and that is the situation where the solicitor prepares the will, and rightly or wrongly, the testator thinks he hasn't, the, the will drafter hasn't got it quite right, and he tweaks it a bit on the paper and duly authenticates the tweakings. And I saw, the question then becomes, would that potentially... You know, there might have been an error by the solicitor, which wasn't the thing which was altered by the testator and his tweaking. And as currently worded, you couldn't have st statutory rectification under Section 3 because the will, you couldn't say the will was not by the testator because in part the testator had done something to the will, albeit the offending parts, the error had been done by the solicitor. So it seems to me... It's a, there are grey areas, most obviously when one's dealing with a robot, but also less obviously when one is dealing with someone who has tried to improve the solicitor's drafting. But the error, in fact, is not what they've tried to improve. The error, they just overlooked the solicitor's big error and they've focused on something which is, is trivial. Does, does this also touch on the matter of informal writings? Uh, in, informal writings are... a. a, a which are often provided for in wills. They are. Uh, I, uh, I have tutored in the last two years at Glasgow University, and the standard style wills which the students are taught to use include informal writings clauses, and uh, what they tend to say is uh, they tend to say uh, that effect will be given to informal writings, uh, and there's usually a provision provided they are signed they don't always I mean, that would be the, the style which would tends to be recommended for use they raise horrifically difficult questions in their own right uh which i, I haven't uh, haven't I, I haven't been addressed in this consultation exercise uh but to outline some of the difficulties what happens uh, to do with formalities of execution? You would, with a will, you would normally want it to, to see each sheet signed as well as it's signed at the end, and then it said the will is self-proving, so you can rely on on that, and you take it along to get uh, to the sheriff court and, and get confirmation. Where a normal will hasn't been signed on every sheet, but only at the end, what you have to do is you have to establish. Uh, uh, that that is the will of the test data, and you jump through various hoops. It's usually fairly easy to jump through the hoops, but it can be a little more difficult. That's 
section section four, but you can get in where you have informal writings. I wonder. There are all sorts of yes. collateral I issues. I suspect we're, tra yeah. we're now travelling into. Yeah. It seems to me things that are not in the bill before no. us, yes. which for this committee perhaps yeah, I, is for another day. I, I think, I think <laughs> unless it is relevant to, you know, I, I from the chair do need to point out we have strayed. And, and yeah. interesting though it might be, can we get back to the, to the you, bill you, before us, please? You, in relation to purely interactification, you could have a situation. Let us assume that the informal yes. writing uh, is effective. There's nothing wrong with the informal writing. We're just on that assumption. The error lies in the in the parent will. So the the error is by the solicitor in the parent will. On one view, given you look at the informal writing and the will as one document, you would seem to be excluded from relying on rectification in that context. I, th I think I think perhaps there's one thing that that is that is worth mentioning, and it and it underlines my view, and I think this is where Nick, Nick and I differ. I, I take the view that there have to be instructions to a person, a human being. I think is as Mr. Stevenson, as you referred to, whereas I think Nick takes the view instructions to robot might suffice, or instructions into the into the internet. Um, but the, the 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 reason why I take the view that a court would see instructions as being instructions to a person is tied in with the reason for this specific definition, and that is a practical one. It is contemplated that um, it may be easier to satisfy the requirements for rectification if one can then lead as a witness the person who has been instructed to draft the will and who can say, well, actually, these are my instructions and this is what I was asked to do, but oops, there was a slip. And, um, and that, was, that was a slip that happened. Uh, we, we, we put our hands up, but it's quite clear that the testator intended it to be as per these instructions given to me, and that's and that's a sort of practical reason I think why it, the, um, uh, the section three has been drafted in in the way that it has been. One can understand that we, we happen not to uh, agree with it because it's too restrictive, but one can understand that that reasoning. John Scott in here, I think. Yes. On the previous point that Mr. Holroyd was making, if you think there's a gap in terms of the executory in informal writings, and while it's not part of the bill, notwithstanding this is the reason for our consultation with you, is for you to tell us of gaps in provision, and therefore, notwithstanding the convener's remarks about needing to stick to what we're here to do today, would you perhaps consider writing to us about that gap in provision which you see. You mentioned it is an area which is attended with considerable controversy, so it's... Is that, it, may I ask the convener then, is that the reason why it's not no. in this bill then? Well, I think that might be why it's not in this bill. I, I think my, my point simply is that we really should be using our time to address things that can be altered reasonably within the bill. I recognise that there is overlap with other issues, and I wouldn't for one moment want to disagree with John Scott. If you feel that there is anything else that needs to be added in written evidence, please do, recognising that some of that may be appropriate for other legislation or might not be be acted on at all. Certainly don't want to be restrictive on that. I cannot help thinking, I'm just about to bring John Scott in of course on, on, on uh, issues of time limits, um, but I cannot help thinking that we've just heard enough this morning to recognise that the interaction between myself as a general citizen and advice I might get from the internet is now an issue which the law is going to have to address. We're not going to answer those questions this morning, but it is plain that that is what we're going... The courts are going to have to address that issue pretty soon, and it might be fairly sensible if we as legislators, and I'm talking as much to the government on the record here as I am to myself, actually thought about how we're going to interact with that, because it's bound to happen. I, I think if I may say so, um, uh, convener, I think you've raised an extremely important and, and, and valuable point. I mean, it, it's, it's really focused in section three, subsection one, by the words, on the testator's instructions. Yep. Instructions in the past have always been seen as to individuals, but now they might be being seen as 
as to other things, to use an entirely neutral word. Well, okay, but robots robots are only programmed, and it's the programmer who is a human being. And we're, mm. it doesn't matter how far back you go on who writes the programs, there's a human back there somewhere. Mm. Um, but that, I suspect, is for another day and another <laughs> place. Uh, John, would you like to rapidly take us on to time limits before, before we actually run out of time as well? Yes, okay. indeed, and returning to Section 4.1 uh, and the question already put to the previous panel, about um, stakeholders giving evidence committee, including yourself, said it would be better if the relevant time limit for applying to court for rectification ran from the date of death. However, as you know, Ellie Scobie reminded the committee last week that until confirmation is granted, a will is not a public record, notwithstanding what um, Professor uh, Paisley said. I uh, suggested that if the time uh, period ran from the date of death, ex executors could delay the, de the grant of confirmation when it was in their personal interest to do so. Do you agree with that point? Have you any points to make around that? As far as the, the point that was made about an executor um, uh, delaying um, in order to prevent rectification, clearly that would be a breach of duty um, by uh, the executor. Um, and if that could be established, then... Um, uh, that would, uh, it is likely, amount to a cause shown for waiving the time limit. Um, I think that view has been expressed by a number of um, persons giving evidence, and that would be uh, our view uh, on that as well. Um, what uh, we think is extremely important um, is that um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the time limit be firmly anchored in the first place. At the moment, as the provision is drafted, the time limit begins either from death or from the granting of confirmation. It's really not clear which it is. One has to go one way or the other. One has to go either um, the English way, which I think um, Ailey Scobie seems to prefer, which is anchoring it to the confirmation, uh, in which case, um, as confirmations might not be obtained for a number of years, um, de facto, the time limit could go on for for a long time, or tie it to death, um, as uh, we prefer, um, uh, in order to try and give some measure of uh, certainty subject to the provision of cause shown to waive that time limit. Uh, so the other thing that has to be borne in mind as well is that um, uh, as a matter of general law, um, uh, there are, si there are six months for um, creditors to come forward uh, to an executor to uh, recover their debts from the uh, deceased's estate. Um, the executor has to settle those, um, those uh, debts. Um, at that point, once they're, once they're settled or there's reasonable uh, estate to settle them, after six months, the beneficiaries begin to be entitled to be paid. Beneficiaries will be aware of that, and therefore one could reasonably expect uh, that a will is going to come to light um, on any view uh, within one year of the death. There will be exceptions, but one can reasonably expect that. Uh, it is also uh, quite common or not uncommon for um, uh, uh, individuals to um, seek to uh, rearrange the um, uh, the uh, inheritance, uh, particularly in order to avoid inheritance tax, uh, and that's done by documents known as instruments of variation. Uh, and if these are um, executed within two years of the death, then from the point of view of the revenue. Uh, the will is, or the succession is taken to be um, as stated in that instrument of variation, and they have to be done within two years of death. So again, that anticipates that everyone will be aware uh, of the will by that, by that, certainly well before that time, so they've got time to actually arrange the instrument of variation. So it seemed um, to us that... Uh, First of all, for certainty, the period should be tied to death. And secondly, um, so far as the time scale involved, um, bearing in mind the, the distress in the initial months and, and, and what have you, six months was too little, but 
two years seemed to us to be appropriate. Thank you so much. Thank you. That deals with question five, and I think question six has already been exhausted. So um, if we could move on to John Mason, please. Thank you. So, yes. Um, I think in your written uh, submission, you mentioned the uh, retrospective effect that sections five and eight of the bill might have. <coughs> now, we did raise that with the government, and their clarification is that section five is intended to apply only in respect of wills revoked after commencement, uh, and furthermore, it intends section eight to apply to documents executed on or after commencement. So I'm just wondering if you are satisfied with that or if you still have uh, problems or reservations about that. That would satisfy our concerns. I would suggest that that is made explicit in the legislation. Um, the, there is a tension in Scots law between, on the one hand, putting oneself in the, the armchair of the testator and thinking, what did the testator mean when he wrote the will? And another principle, which is that the will speaks from the date of death, the second principle is associated with a case called Calendar's Trustees. So it seems to me critically important that it is made clear that there is not retrospective effect in, intended, because the likelihood is, uh, although David and myself have gone over the draft uh, reports of this committee, the likelihood is that's not going to be available to your average practitioner, and it seems to be very important that it's actually user-friendly and in the legislation. So, so your feeling is that the bill as it stands could be interpreted in different ways? Well, I think it just would be sensible to make it crystal clear that these provisions only apply in such and such a situation. It might well be, I think how these things are often dealt with is that the transitional provisions, uh, or dare one say it's some raft of regulations, it seems to to trust bar, it would be desirable that it should just be made clear in the primary legislation. Okay, thank you. I think that takes us back to John Scott for question eight. <coughs> thank Please. you, yes. And can I take you now to section six, and speci specifically section six two of the bill, which allows the testator to state in his or her will that section six should not apply. Uh, trust bar has made a specific point relating to Section 6.2 of the Bill, suggesting that it needs to be revised to give greater clarity about the effect of a legacy of the residue in certain circumstances. Okay. However, in oral evidence, the committee of the SLC said that it was happy with the drafting of Section 6.2 as it stood. Accordingly, and for the benefit of the record, could you explain what your proposed changes are and why you think they are necessary and indeed important in practice, please. Yes. <coughs> in, we, 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 we put in, we put in a, a proposal in our original, um, in our original submission, um, and uh, it is, it's page eight of the original uh, submission. In fact, goes on to page eight, goes on to page nine, and it would be to insert a new subsection 3A, which says, um, and I just quote, without prejudice to the generality of subsection 2, it is not to be regarded as clear from the terms of the will that the testator intended otherwise if the testator provides for a legacy of the residue of the estate to a person other than the issue of A. So uh, the, the point that um, we were concerned was with was uh, a situation uh, which commonly occurs where um, a, a legacy is left to person A, this can, and this can occur with a homemade will, for example, uh, and there is a residuary provision uh, to uh, a person, we'll call them D. And uh, in that situation, if one is a, if one is a lay person, uh, then uh, one might think that, in fact... Um, the legacy. I want to leave this particular property to um, uh, to this son, but if I'm not leaving the property to this son, I want to leave it to all my children because I'm leaving the legacy, the the residue rather, at the whole balance. I'm leaving to my children. So the the view might be well, if he predeceases or anything, I'm leaving it to him. It's specific to him. 
otherwise it goes otherwise it goes to all of them um and it might be seen there might be an argument that the trust that the testator has made is made his position clear if son a doesn't get it everyone else is everyone else is getting it but um it seemed to us that um that argument should be eliminated um because the overall intention of this provision is that um uh, notwithstanding the policy here as i understand it is that notwithstanding the uh, uh legacy to residue um there is to be uh, inheritance by a's children in preference to say the the uh, in preference to say the other siblings of a and that's the policy but it just seemed to us that um uh there could be an argument again over the word clear and the suggest the proposed amendment we suggested was to put that argument is aimed to put that argument to bed and to make it plain to any reader that a legacy of residue will not prevail over the issue of the specific legatee worth worth remembering that this provision is um confined to issue of the testator so if you if 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 the testator leaves uh, a legacy to his son what we, and there was no residue clause to complicate matters or if it was left out of account and the son died the, it would then under this proposal it would go to the to the son's children let us say only had one child to the son's child what concerns us uh, is that where in a sep where there is no uh, express contemplation of this given by the testator what should happen if the son dies but there is a residue clause uh, that could spoil the well intention the good intentions of the of the drafter of this piece of legislation and create a doubt whether uh, a's grandchildren should get them get the money um, there is another twist which we bring out in the memorandum at um, page five of the memorandum as distinct from the written evidence. And that is, um, and I think this is a fairly, it's not a very common way of looking at things, but it does happen where, for example, the testator wishes to leave as much as he can to, we'll keep it simple, a, a child, uh, up to the point where inheritance tax would come into play and he wants to leave the balance to someone who can benefit from reliefs. So for example, the, the wife, the spouse, or conceivably a charity. Now, that would be dealt with in the residue clause. Now to take the situation where the testator's son has died, it's very unlikely that um, he wouldn't have wanted to make, that he'd have wanted it all to uh, to go into the residue clause because ex hypothesis that has been planned against in a tax planning context that he's wanting to benefit from reliefs for the balance either in favor of the spouse or in favor of a charity so all we're really saying is that the residue clause should as it were be neutral uh, and it shouldn't weigh against the, um, the testator's deceased son or daughter uh, that what was destined for them going to the grandchildren. So it's 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 perhaps not the most exciting thing, but it does seem to me it could create problems again if you imagine a solicitor reading the will, reading the legislation. Ah, well there is a sort of a there is a provision as to what's to happen. It's to go to residue, and what we want to make clear is that that residue clause doesn't displace um, the, the good intentions of of the draftsman by allowing it to go to the to the grandchildren uh, of the testator if the child has died. I, th I, think, it's, I think it's fair to say in context, um, uh, as um, uh, advocates in practice, um, we are uh, very conscious of um, arguments appearing on the back of words, as it were, where perhaps um, at first glance people didn't think that those arguments were available. And we're also conscious that sometimes these arguments can actually gain traction um, uh, with courts and uh, different views can arise. So um, 
uh, really uh, at, at the cost of um, cutting off maybe a very sp a small line of work for us, we would suggest that um, matters be, um, uh, be clarified. I think it's clear that we would always endorse the view that makes sure that things do not finish up in courts. I have great respect for lawyers, but the less work we can give you as legislators, undoubtedly the better we do our legislation. Uh, John, does that complete that? It does. Indeed. Right. I'm wondering whether I could take us on to the difficult issue of uncertainty, uh, not merc mercifully in any mathematical sense, but you will have already heard the discussions and, and of course, you raised it yourselves in, in evidence. Um, I think there is a general point accepted that where legislation talks about certainty or its absence, then that may itself constitute an uncertainty. Um, but I'm wondering if as practitioners you could lead us down the line that's going to get to a good answer here, please. Yes, the, um, uh, the word uncertainty is already in, exist in the existing legislation in relation to, to common calamity. Uh, and it has already given rise to litigation, most notably in the shape of a case in the mid-1970s called Lamb against the Lord Advocate. Uh, and in that particular case, um, the, the judge at first instance uh, analyzed the English authorities on the use of the word uncertainty and found that in England, um, uh, in the leading case, a number of different judges had expressed quite conflicting views as to what was or was not uncertain. Um, that judge then reached a particular view. It was then appealed up to the inner house of the Court of Session, the Appeal Court, uh, and the Appeal Court held, in, in a nutshell, that, um, uh, that um, uh, uncertainty um, uh, simply uh, means... Um, that it cannot be established on a balance of probabilities that one person survived the other. That that was the that was the outcome. Now it seems it seemed to us uh, that in the light of that case uh, and what was observed about the word uncertainty, uh, uh, the that outcome um, established on a balance of probabilities should really be um, the uh, wording used um, uh, in this new statutory provision. Um, one should not have to go back to lamb against the Lord Advocate in order to actually understand what uncertainty means. And on page 10 of our, of our written evidence, um, we suggest that it should say, uh, in circumstances where it cannot be established who survived whom, where it cannot be established who survived whom, um, uh, the established would be understood as being on the balance of probabilities. Uh, I don't think we'd have any difficulty in the words balance of probabilities being used, but established, if, you, if one establishes something, then in any civil law matter, one does so on a balance of probabilities. That was the outcome, ultimately, of the Lamb case, but one had to go there, and it seemed, it seemed to us, why use a word which um, uh, causes issues? And I think the point that Professor Paisley made uh, earlier this morning, I think, was extremely well put. Thank you. <coughs> um, I, I'd also like to take you back to, to last week's evidence, and, and Alan Barr, who I, I, I think, uh, in this context, said that Sometimes it almost doesn't matter what the answer is in these common calamity kind of situations as long as one's certain what the law is telling you. Because I, I think I, I'm reading into this into what, 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 what was behind it, really, that nobody contemplates these things uh, and, and therefore all you need to be able to, be, to do is to sort out the horrible mess rather than try and work out what was intended because it was never going to be in contemplation and nothing was ever intended. I'm sure there are uh, exceptions to people's attitudes, I think one thing is probable in most cases is that there is no desire that it should that the the estate should go to the crown. Hence, yes. the suggestion which Trussbar made, and I think has met with quite a lot of approval in some quarters. So maybe the bottom line is that we should be sure. It comes back to the previous conversation this morning that it goes to a human beneficiary rather than the crown. 
Uh, and maybe at that point you would endorse Alan Barr's comment that it probably doesn't really matter who it goes to because it was never in contemplation anyway. <laughs> As, as long as it does go, as long as it does go to to a um, uh, to a human, I mean, the uncertain things a drafting point. But the, the what is important here, the consequences of the of the new rule, and what we drew attention to was, in fact, the uh, the difficulty with the old common law, which led to the sixty four reform, which is now to be changed, and that was highlighted in the in the Clyde Bank Blitz case. Um, which we mentioned in the written memo. In the written memo, this was um, 1941, uh, where there was a, a, a father, a mother, husband, wife, and two children. She owned um, National Savings. Uh, uh, the the whole house was was bombed, and they all died, and it couldn't be established who survived whom. Um, she herself um, did not have any other uh, blood relatives, and did not leave a will. Uh, there was a claim uh, put forward um, uh, by uh, her brothers-in-law, that's the that's the husband's uh, siblings, to the to the national savings, um, on the basis that um, uh, on the basis that they were the uncles of the children, uh, and I think also the um, on the basis they were the sisters of the wife. Um, Neither of those arguments was successful before the court because the common law was essentially the one that's being sought to be re-established now, uh, which was it could not be proved who, su who survived whom. Uh, couldn't be provided who survived whom. It was intestate. No other blood relative could be identified. Therefore, it went to the Crown. And the Crown actually fought that quite hard. Um, and it just seemed to us that um, it, whilst... Um, the argument for moving away from doing everything by age is a good one. We should not have to be revisited with the Clyde Bank Blitz outcome. Yes. Okay. John. Forgive me if I've got this completely wrong, but in evidence last week, and I'm not certain that I'm even referring to the right thing, but did Lord Wheatley not make some... Um, judgment on this um, more recently than the Clyde Bank? Well, he, was, he, was, he was involved in the, in the Lamb case with uncertainty. Uh -huh. he, was, he, he was involved in the Lamb case and it was ultimately uh, his uh, opinion in the uh, inner house which said that um, uh, all that has to be established for uncertainty is that it cannot be proved on a balance of probabilities that one person survived the other. That was his role in the mid-70s in the Lamb case. And that would be a view you would presumably share? Uh, that, that would be a view that, that we would share, but um, we, I suppose the view we take is that his view should really be put into, into statute, so we move away from that word uncertainty. Excellent. Thank you. <coughs> right. I think after a very interesting morning, we've actually finish this evidence section. Can I say thank you very much indeed to Mr. Bartos and Mr. Holroyd and, and to, to the gathered company. If anything more does occur to you, possibly in the small hours of the night, feel free to, to write to us, um, but hopefully not extensively because I think we've probably pretty much received all the evidence we're going to be able to cope with. Thank you very much indeed. I shall thank you very much for um, inviting us to, to give evidence. Um, has very much appreciated the opportunity and uh, is very committed to trying to assist the committee in promoting the ideas uh, of legislation which is uh, clear and, and user-friendly. Uh, and what we've tried to do in, in providing that assistance is also try to promote the idea of the legislation in this area chiming with other areas of the law yes. so far as possible. Could, could I perhaps uh, just footnote, say, um, Professor Paisley mentioned um, at the end, uh, he made comments about Donatio Mortis Causa. Um, we'd entirely associate ourselves with those, with those comments of Professor Paisley at the end. Thank you very much indeed. Can I just briefly suspend uh, while we allow the witnesses to leave us? Uh, and we'll resume shortly. Thank you.
Thank you. Let's move on to agenda item three, instruments subject to affirmative procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the International Organisation's Immunities and Privileges Scotland Amendment Order 2015 draft. Members may wish to be aware that this instrument was withdrawn and subsequently relayed following correspondence with our legal adviser. Is the committee content with this instrument, please? Thank you. Agenda item four, instrument subject to negative procedure, the Sea Fishing EU Control Measure Scotland Order 2015, SSI 2015 320. This instrument contains a provision which is unclear. Article 23.1a could more clearly provide that the court is not enabled to order the detention of a boat, its gear and catch for a period after the date when a fine is paid, the purpose of the detention being the recovery of that fine. The instrument also contains a drafting error. In Part 1 of the schedule uh, at inserted entry 1DA, column 3 of the table specifies a requirement in relation to EU fishing boats with an overall length of 10 metres or more, contravention of which constitutes an offence. The requirement at B is to submit the landing obligation as soon as possible, but this should refer to a landing declaration. Does the committee agree to draw the order to the attention of the Parliament on the following reporting grounds? One on ground H is the meaning of Article 23. 1A could be clearer, and two on the general reporting ground in respect of the drafting error. Agree, it, does the committee also agree to call on the Scottish Government to lay an amendment to correct those matters in due course? Yes. Thank you. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the land and building transaction tax, open ended investment companies, Scotland regulations 2015, SSI 2015 322 nor on the water environment, relevant enactments and designation of responsible authorities and functions, Scotland, Amendment Order 2015, SSI 2015, 323, nor the Police Pensions Scheme, Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015, SSI 2015, 325, nor the Schedule of Monuments and Listed Buildings, Miscellaneous Amendments, Scotland's Regulations 2015, SSI 2015, 328. Is the committee content with these, please? Content. Thank you. Agenda item five, instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Private Rented Housing Scotland Act 2011 Commencement Number 7 Order 2015, SSI 2015 326, nor on the Procurement Reform Scotland Act 2014 Commencement Number 1 Order 2015, SSI 2015 331. Is the committee content with these, please? Okay. Thank you. Gender item six, the Alcohol Licensing Public Health and Criminal Justice Scotland Bill. The purpose of this item is for the committee to consider the delegated powers provisions in the bill at stage one. The committee is invited to agree the questions it wishes to raise with the member proposing this bill on the delegated powers in written correspondence. The committee will have the opportunity to consider the responses at a future meeting before the draft report is considered. Section two imposes a new mandatory sorry imposes new mandatory conditions which would prohibit in life licensed premises or as part of an occasional license, the sale of alcoholic drinks with a caffeine content in excess of such amount as may be prescribed by regulations. The bill would insert new paragraphs into the Licensing Scotland Act 2005, which would require Scottish ministers to prescribe a maximum amount of caffeine in caffeinated alcoholic drinks no later than 12 months after the royal assent. The Delegated Powers Memorandum does not explain the reasoning behind requiring Scottish ministers to prescribe a maximum amount no later than 12 months. Equally, the members' intentions regarding different levels, sorry, regarding levels of caffeine in relation to premise, premises licences and occasional licences are not outlined. Does the committee agree to ask the member in charge of the bill for explanation of the following matters in relation to the powers in sections 2, 3 and 4, inserting paragraph 8, 1, of Schedule 3 and Paragraph 7A1 of Schedule 4 to the 2005 Act. A. Scottish Ministers must prescribe an amount, a maximum level of caffeine in caffeinated alcoholic drinks under these powers no later than 12 months after the date of Royal Assent to the Bill. Why has this timing been chosen as suitable? And B. It appears that these powers would enable Ministers pr to prescribe either the same or different maximum amounts for the purposes of premises, licences and occasional licences under the 2005 Act. Why is this considered to be appropriate? Yes. The commencement powers provide for certain provisions as listed in subsection 1 to come into force on the day after Royal Assent. The other provisions are proposed to automatically commence 12 months after royal assent unless ministers bring any of them into force earlier by regulation under subsection 2. Those commencement powers are relatively unusual as they set out when certain provisions come into force unless less regulations are made to commence these provisions earlier. Such powers take into account 
that this is a member's bill rather than a government bill. Does the committee agree to ask the member in charge of the bill for explanation of the following matters in relation to the commencement powers in section 34? A. Subsection 1 of the section lists various provisions which could be brought into force, sorry, which come into force on the day after the Royal Assent. Subsection 2 provides that the other provisions come into force at the end of 12 months from the day of the Royal Assent or on such earlier date as Scottish ministers may by regulations appoint. It's the <coughs> committee to content to seek clarification why various provisions as listed in subsection 1 have been selected as suitable commencement on the day after royal assent with the other provisions coming to force by regulations and b why has the timing of 12 months from royal assent to the bill been selected as a suitable long stop date by which scottish ministers must have commenced the remaining provisions thank you at which point i move the meeting into private thank you very much